Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and also help them to succeed in their careers and lives. I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North American headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas, and I graduated with a degree in civil engineering from UT Austin. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. I'm a licensed engineer at DCI Engineers, practicing on structural projects in California with an undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's degree in structural engineering from UC San Diego. Before we introduce our guests, we'd like to let you know that the Engineering Management Institute recently launched another podcast, the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, which can be found at geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com. This podcast will be focused on helping geotechnical engineers stay up to date with the latest technical trends in the field. The host is award-winning geotechnical leader, Jared Green, a licensed professional engineer who's been practicing as a geotechnical engineer for 20 years. You can find all of the episodes on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. And you can request guest topics and ideas at geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com. In this episode, we talked to Antonio Zaldivar de Alba, a teacher and research assistant at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He'll be talking about wind engineering and provide our listeners with three great benefits that they can get by joining ASCE's Structural Engineering Institute, or SEI. He believes that we, structural engineering professionals, should seek innovative solutions to make infrastructure safer and more resilient. Now, let's jump into our conversation with Antonio. Antonio, welcome to the Structural Engineering Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So I understand that you are a teacher and a research assistant at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. What subjects are you teaching there and what is it that you research? Yeah, so my teaching assistant responsibilities actually are mainly grading and holding office hours. I do teach sometimes when the professor is not available. Uh, he either travels for a conference or has a meeting. That's when I uh, step up and teach. Uh, I have been a research, a teaching assistant sorry, for Steel Structures 1. That is basically an undergrad course uh, where the students learn the basics of the structural design of the steel members. Basically, we teach them how to design members, uh, steel members for te by tension, flexure, compres compression, and then we end with a combination of, uh, of loading, basically compression and flexure or tension and flexure. And that's uh, what we cover in the steel structures mm -hmm. one. Also, I have experience uh, being teaching assistant of wind engineering, but it's uh, basically my area of research. And this course was actually developed by my advisor, Professor Frank Lombardo at the University of Illinois. And this is mainly an introduction of the basics of uh, wind engineering. Um, additionally to that, uh, this last spring, I was the teaching assistant for the structural engineering seminar series at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. And this course, uh, we just invite distinguished uh, structural engineering speakers uh, from both the academia and the industry to come to, uh, over to the University of Illinois and give a talk to our student body. And basically, my main responsibility in this course is just uh, making announcements and making everything that, uh, making sure that everything runs smoothly, and making sure the presentation is set when the speaker is, uh, and the speaker has water, and basically uh, not teaching responsibilities. And regarding my research um, assistant job, uh, I've been working with Professor uh, Frank Lombardo for now, I think, three and a half years. Um, and I have been involved in, in several research projects. But now what I'm working on is uh, actually on the development of novel wind engineering instruments to capture information from extreme wind events. And actually, this project uh, was recently funded by NIST as part of the Disaster Resilience Grant. So, yeah, this is uh, basically overall what my teaching assistants and research assistant responsibilities involved in, at the University of Illinois. Awesome. Could you go into uh, wind engineering? So as you know, for me working in engineering, I kind of see like the research uh, or the effects of your research, you know, like the wind loads, but could you go into wind engineering, I guess 101 for people that aren't too uh, familiar, particularly in wind engineering and how all those things come into play? For sure, for sure. Actually, yeah, wind engineering will always have kind of the trouble of being related to 
with only wind energy. Obviously, that's not true for structural engineers because you deal with the AC7 wind load, so you know that at least wind also loads load structures. But really, a wind engineering, kind of the dictionary definition, it's a dif discipline concerned with the effects of the wind uh, on the natural and, and built environment. So both the natural and built. And as you can guess from this definition, it's a truly diverse uh, subject that requires knowledge in many different fields or disciplines. And just to give you an example for my research, I uh, need to know a little bit about fluid mechanics, statistics, meteorology, uh, signal processing, and obviously structural engineering. Uh, but uh, we also deal, like, especially with um, loads in buildings, uh, and there are, even within that, um, specifically of load, uh, buildings loads uh, for wind, there are specific areas uh, of research, such as bri bridge loading, that is completely different uh, how you manage a bridge, how you design a bridge for wind, than how you design a low-rise building, for example, where you, the load is more static, right? And also when you have a high-rise buildings where you have issues of vortex shedding and some type of vortex that can generate and the, the nor usually the natural frequency of the high-rise buildings uh, stay more or less in within the bounds that can be really affected by wind. So usually the taller you go, the more important wind is for your structure. So um, again, we deal with uh, many different things. Another research area in the wind engineering field, it's uh, obviously wind energy, but also we deal with pedestrian comfort for urban areas, uh, some pollutant dispersion, and obviously wind lo loading of buildings. And yeah, so it's extremely diverse uh, field. I just want like uh, kind of to highlight that, that there are many different fields within the wind engineering field. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Sounds really diverse, but can you tell me where, do, where is it that is really your area of focus or what is what yeah. brought you to be so passionate about wind engineering? So actually I became passionate about wind engineering thanks to Professor Frank Lombardo, that it's a, he's a pro assistant professor at the University of Illinois. I started doing research with, with him on thunderstorm loading. So I mainly research, my main research is on how thunderstorm winds affect differently structures um, because they have different characteristics as the normal wind that we designed for. And yeah, that's what, how I became passionate about wind engineering. I started like to look at the loads in low rise buildings uh, using real actual data. And you can see the random nature, not only of the wind, but also the pressures. And you deal with the statistics, extreme value analysis, and many other tools that you need to, in order to kind of do this research right. Um, yes. So I find that really interesting because I've also, I guess, I mean, I grew up in Texas and um, I'm from mainland in like internal Texas, central Texas, and uh, I've never really been concerned about hurricane winds by any means, but I have, I've seen a fair share of a good Midwestern thunderstorm. Um, and I've always, I, I grew up kind of curious about how that affected buildings. Um, you know, is there something from your past that got you interested specifically in thunderstorms, thunderstorm winds? Uh, actually, no, not really. Uh, I was just mainly doing my master's degree at the University of Illinois. I was planning on doing a, just a professional master's that is only course, coursework. And then in, at the University of Illinois, you have the opportunity to do independent research as part of your coursework. So this independent research entails that you just contact a professor and you, instead of a course, you actually do research in his area. And kind of, it's like a course slash research where you kind of go a little deeper into the research area. And then I started doing that like a, as part of my coursework. And I said, okay, I really like this. Like, I really like what I'm doing. I'm solving like challenging problems, um, uh, well, or trying to solve them, right? <laughs> because that's how research goes. Sometimes you don't, <laughs> you don't quite find the answer, but um, uh, yeah, that's what got me interested. And then I started working more and, and, and I always loved structural engineering as a kid because my dad was a structural engineer. So kind of that was my path towards uh, wind engineering, kind of love structural engineering and then met Professor Frank Lombardo and then he kind of, uh, I leaned towards wind engineering with him because I enjoy work, working with him and, and the topic that I was working was super interesting to me. Yeah. Sometimes it's good to have a mentor that kind of pulls you along to a specific path. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, and so just final to wrap up this, this topic of thunderstorm winds, what role do you see that thunderstorm uh, winds plays in structural engineering design? 
Yeah, so actually that's a topic of current research. And um, for example, currently in ASC7, uh, the design wind speeds uh, take into consideration thunderstorm winds. What do I mean with this? When you see the map on ASC7 and you see the design wind speeds for different levels of, uh, for different uh, return periods, um, these, these wind speeds are already considering that the thunderstorm winds come from a different distribution than normal winds. So, because thunderstorm winds are generated from storms, they follow a different distribution than the, what we call like normal winds of atmospheric boundary layer winds, the ones that we design. So, this is already taken into consideration. You, what actually you do is you develop two different extreme value distributions, and then you take the one that it's controlling. And actually, in, most, in a lot of parts of the US, the thunderstorm winds are the one that control the design wind speeds uh, for uh, long return periods. So now that we're actually designing for wind speeds that we're able to uh, reach using with thunderstorms, um, the thing is that we don't know how to design for them because uh, these winds have different characteristics as normal winds. Uh, the winds that we design for, uh, we usually use a, an atmospheric boundary layer, uh, boundary layer wind tunnel, sorry, a boundary layer wind tunnel, that the objective of this tunnel is to simulate the atmospheric boundary layer. And what's the atmospheric boundary layer? Basically, you have that the wind speed increases with height. So you have lower wind speed closer to the ground and higher wind speeds uh, upper. But this doesn't happen in many cases in during thunderstorm winds. Sometimes during thunderstorm winds, you can have the highest wind speeds a little bit closer to the ground, like for example, on the order of 10 meters. That it uh, so this is a fundamental, fundamentally different from like the normal wind that we design for. And other differences are like, uh, in thunderstorm winds, sometimes you can have a vertical component because you know sometimes uh, you have these storms called dampers that in, impact the, the the ground, and then you generate these vortices that can generate a vertical component of the wind, which has been shown to be important for the roof pressures or suctions. Uh, so yeah, they, they are fundamentally different. And the thing is, okay, we are considering the the wind speeds from thunderstorms uh, already in the design wind speeds. But really in the load part, uh, we don't know how these thunderstorm winds load the structure differently. And that's kind of part of my research. How, uh, if, if they do, right, we, we don't know. We are trying to assess the difference of, between thunderstorm winds and normal winds. The ones that we already have everything in the design. We have a uh, boundary layer wind tunnels to design for, uh, for this type of winds. But I'm really looking if we, there are some difference with uh, thunderstorm winds. In your assessment of these differences between the two types of wind, how is it that you're collecting information about how these winds act? And then how are you modeling it when you're doing different types of research? Yeah, so um, there are different research, uh, actually approach uh, to this, uh, thunderstorm wind loading. Um, one is using CFD simulations that basically use fluid mechanics equations and uh, to simulate the, the dampers and how it affects the structures. And the second one is actually using modified wind tunnels where they actually try to simulate better the characteristics of thunderstorms, such that they add uh, some uh, additional things to the boundary layer wind tunnel in order to replicate some of the characteristics of thunderstorm winds. And then they get data using a model of the loading. And what I'm trying to do is actually get uh, actual data from full scale events uh, in order to actually validate the CFD and wind tunnel methods, because as of now, there are really few studies that have where that we actually have a full scale data from thunderstorm winds. This is obviously challenging because thunderstorm winds, as you can imagine, they are locally, uh, they are spatially and temporally uh, small, so they happen in a matter of like uh, minutes, and they are not as big as, a, an, as a, an atmospheric boundary layer event where you have several kilometers of high winds. So it's really hard to capture them. And that's why at the University of Illinois, we're developing some new instrumentation that is fully mobile, such that we can uh, have a higher probability of capturing this, this type of events. Um, yeah, so my, my approach is basically getting full scale data of loading and wind and characteristics of these events, such that we can actually validate what we're doing with CFD and wind tunnels. Probably not solving everything, but kind of uh, have a benchmark desk or something like that, kind of provide that uh, data set that people can relate to when they want to validate their, their models. Okay, so it looks like, so with 
So in wind tunnels and the, the way that we usually design for code, that usually just takes into account like high winds, but thunderstorms, they basically behave differently, right? And, right. and so that's, it looks like that's what you're kind of trying to figure out. How do these thunderstorms behave? How do they affect the loading? And even in a wind tunnel, that's not how a thunderstorm behaves. So you're trying to find ways in your research through inst instrumentation to trying to find out how to best simulate thunderstorm, thunderstorm wind conditions and even in the wind tunnel, right? Correct, correct. Could, you. could you go into kind of what the, what the instrumentation uh, looks like? That, that seems pretty interesting. Like how are you guys capturing mm -hmm. that data? Is it, what do you have a truck that records the wind speeds or yeah, how are you guys even trying to do that? Like what's the process? Yeah, so uh, this is part of, uh, obviously this is led by Professor Frank Lombardo at the Wind Engineering Research Laboratory at the University of Illinois. And we are basically working now in two novel instruments uh, that can capture these extreme winds. The first one is a portable loading cube. And the second one is a strain-based anemometer. So talking about the, the first one, the portable loading cube. This is uh, a four foot cube uh, that it's um, able to capture pressure in 100, 26 points throughout the cube. So they are distributed uh, symmetrically throughout the cube. And it's a pretty small cube, right? It's not the size of a low rise building. Uh, it's, uh, but the objective of this cube is uh, to be fully mobile. Actually, you can put it in a truck and just uh, ride with it. And it runs on batteries, uh, so you can deploy it and then mm, it runs by itself. You don't need to connect it to power. And, um, yeah, it's uh, fast, also really fast to deploy, like we can deploy it in less than 30 minutes. And this is uh, in order to be able to put it in the spot where we think that it, the likelihood of the wind of high winds is higher, or an actually thunderstorm wind is higher. So we need to deploy it fast, and, and it has to be, be, again, fully mobile because you don't have, uh, it runs on batteries. And actually now we're just finishing an article uh, that we plan to submit to the Journal of Wind Engineering and Industrial Aerodynamics. Uh, where we prove the validity of this uh, portable loading cube, meaning that, uh, okay, it's a four foot uh, cube, right? But what we're, what we're proving here is that this uh, bluff body, that it's a small cube, actually behaves as a larger full scale low rise, low rise building, kind of in the order of uh, uh, three meters uh, to 18.3 meters, uh, sorry for the uh, SI units there. Uh, so, yeah, so 10 feet to 50 feet? <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that we're, we're trying to prove that like, this actually, although it's not this, uh, the same height, it can behave as a full scale. So, therefore, we can uh, get valuable data using this cube. And that's the first part of the this instrumentation. So, also, for sorry, for so, that one, um, mm -hmm. you're saying mobile. So, does that mean you take that? modeling that that cube model and go into a thunderstorm yeah so you're like yeah. a storm chaser like twister uh, that movie. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> chasing thunderstorms yeah <laughs> yeah we try to capture thunderstorms obviously uh, we have a um uh, the professor has a lot of experience uh, uh, he used to chase tornadoes uh, yeah, for, yeah, his, cool. for his research so, and we also have a, obviously within the safety of, of research, right? We're not chasing tornadoes for this research, we're just chasing <laughs> thunderstorms. Uh, uh, because we try to have your uh, high winds and also uh, we try to be fast deployable. And also the cube has uh, some hours, like five hours of, uh, of data collection. So it's not that we're putting the cube and next 40 minutes, the high winds are gonna come. We have some uh, leeway to work, uh, to work such that uh, everybody's in, uh, perfectly safe. And, and nothing happens, right? And we also have a, I know in, in part, as part of the research team, we have a um, Zach uh, Weinhoff uh, from, he did his uh, master's in atmospheric sciences and he now switched to master in structural engineering. He finished his uh, atmospheric science uh, master's and now he, he switched gears to structural engineering and he knows uh, way too much about a storm. So he's kind of the lead uh, that, what, that tells us where to go and, and where, what is the best spot to be in. Yeah, but indeed we're trying to capture these events. We, we need to, to be close to them, so yeah. Very interesting. Um, I think I, I'd take the thunderstorm over the tornado any day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm awesome. sorry, and the second part of the instrumentation is just a strain-based anemometer. Uh, 
actually this is being developed by other of my colleagues. Uh, his name is Justin Neville. And this is just a perforated sphere in a, uh, that is sitting on a steel rod. Basically, the perforated sphere se serves as the drag element, basically what it's receiving the wind force. And then the steel rod is the one that measures, uh, serves as the sensing element that is measuring the strain. And then by doing just a back calculation, uh, you can relate the, the force in the rod to the, to the wind speed. And what his, his, this is completely developed by, by him and Professor Lombardo, so, so I don't know much about that, that uh, but I, I know the basics. And that's Enough kind to be of dangerous, tool. right? <laughs> <laughs> that is very interesting. And I love that you mentioned that you, 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 know, you depend on these other colleagues. Um, I imagine they're in like a meteorology department? Uh, actually, yeah, Zach is, was in the meteorology. He was actually doing a PhD in meteorology, but he switched gears to structural engineering. Uh, when he met also Professor Frank Lombardo. So I think he's enjoying a lot of the group and he, he has a lot of experience in atmospheric sciences, but he's doing now in a master's in structural engineering. And yeah, we have a lot of different expertise in, within the group. We are uh, now uh, six, uh, six uh, people in the group. So we have uh, more people to, leaning towards the wind speed estimation, some, some of us more leaning towards the loading structures like me. Uh, but yeah, we have, we have a really nice group uh, at the University of Illinois and, and Really a lot of, uh, as you can see, because to deploy these instruments, you need a group of people that's able to go and actually deploy. So collaboration within the group is, is amazing. You need to, to have a really good group uh, of Absolutely. researchers. Um, and actually they become friends, friends, or really good friends. That's awesome. It's, that's it's very interesting. Experience. Well, and it's so, it's so great. I think there's a lot of structural engineers who maybe feel like they're in a structural engineering bubble because we don't have the exposure to work with people from different backgrounds um, academically. And so I think it's really cool that you get the opportunity to work with an atm atmospheric scientist and someone who has a background in meteorology. Um, I, that's, that's really unique. And I think that's, that's one of the benefits of maybe going back into an academic setting for, for those who are considering doing so. I think that's one of, one of the clear benefits is having that, um, that breadth of exposure to so many different backgrounds that helps you be a better engineer and a better researcher because you, you get that exposure. And you understand some of the issues that they deal with that they may be completely different what you are dealing with so maybe they get some data that it's important for them that it's not that important for us and we're not getting some data that is important for them so it's kind of once you start talking you realize that we could do a lot of collaboration together and, and get actually data that matter for both of us and, that's awesome. any know. examples of that uh, yeah, for example, we're mostly interested in the wind, uh, wind high frequency content. And for some of the fluxes research, they only, we have a professor that is doing some flux research in the University of Illinois. And actually we were planning on using his tower, but at the beginning they had the setup of uh, not recording uh, the high frequency content of wind, which are we're like mainly interested in. But they're basic, they were basically recording, I think, a mean five minutes uh, wind speed. So, which is not, it's, it's useful for us, but not as useful uh, for our research. So that's kind of when, when once you start talking, you realize, okay, maybe we can store more data uh, for your research that will be able to help you more in your research and, and th that type of stuff. It's 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 kind of helpful. Okay, that's something I think a lot of our audience can can relate to. Is you're all trying to uh, you everybody in the same project has their own objectives, and you have to make sure everybody gets what they need out of this out of the situation. So that's awesome. The academics isn't so different to practice. <laughs> yeah. Working Offer. in teams, I, I think <laughs> either way, you're going to be working in teams and yeah, it's everyone has their own goals, but then you guys need each other to um, reach your goals, but being aware of what the other team needs uh, in terms of what their goals are. Yeah, I think it's, it's actually comforting in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Comforting because yeah, you, once you're doing a PhD, one of your like kind of worries is that you're missing a lot in the because I don't have any experience. For example, like I have really few experience working in the professional, so I always feel like all my colleagues that are already graduating from master, like yeah, they're already like moving up in the you know in the industry, and I'm still like <laughs> in the same place where I. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's kind of comforting. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, wonderful. So, um, Antonio, we're going to do a really quick pivot. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise about wind engineering and thunderstorm winds and all of these crazy instruments that you're getting to work with. Um, 
I, I want to pivot to an article that you wrote for ASCE Structural Engineering Institute, or SEI, um, about why engineering students should join SEI. Uh, from what we understand, there are three main benefits that you believe everyone can enjoy when they join SEI. The first one is free membership and scholarship. Can you explain what this means to our listeners and why is that important? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, actually, I wrote that article because I wanted graduate students to realize the great things SEI has to offer. You know, like sometimes in graduate school, you just come to coursework and, and you just leave, right? But, uh, but um, as you can imagine, being a graduate student is a constant struggle for money. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not a, that easy to get money. So the fact that SEI student membership is for free, I think it's a huge deal for graduate students. And, and most of them don't know, don't even know that they, because they're just like, even from undergrad, I, I have had this experience where the ASC uh, chapter charged them some membership, like $10 or $20, just to raise funds uh, for their chapter in, in, the under, in their, wherever they went to undergrad. And they, they come to University of Illinois and then they, they just think that STI also costs some money, right, to join. But thanks to the support that we have at the University of Illinois, our graduate student chapter uh, of SEI, we just allow every structural engineering student to join without any, any fees because we have that support from, from the faculty of the structural engineering uh, group. But also, even if you don't want to join uh, the graduate student chapter, SEI membership is for free, which is, I think, huge because you don't have to waste, you don't have to spend any money that you already like kind of don't have it much. And they give you a magazine and obviously all the benefits of being an SEI member. But, uh, it's kind of, you get a monthly magazine, the structure magazine, which is, has great articles. You can just read and get, get in, more, starting to get involved with the practice and what actually is happening in, in the structural engineering world. And also you have this, this constant webinar conference and the possibility to apply to scholarships, which is actually, I think, really important. I just... Uh, was lucky enough to get and, and honored enough to get the SEI OH AMAN research fellowships. That is one of the fellowships that SEI and ASE give to students. And this was a huge support uh, for me, especially um, now in, in the end of my PhD, um, that allows me to concentrate on my research project. And also, it, it's open for every SEI student member. So, uh, and again, scholarships to go to the, the structure conference. So really, by just for free, uh, and really you don't have to pay much, nothing at all, sorry. <laughs> um, you get all these benefits that really, I don't see any reason why not to join and start to be more involved in the structural engineering community as a student, yeah. Could you go into, um, I know uh, that's a great point because I know as a student, uh, a lot of students don't know that there's scholarships. It's free money for the most yes. part, and especially if you're doing research or getting more into it. Uh, looking for as much scholarships as you can, that's something that I wish I would have done. It would have saved me a lot of money. I was like, oh man, I could have had a couple thousand dollars here and there if I would just applied. And now being in these uh, membership organizations, all these organizations want to give you money, but sometimes you just don't have enough applicants to give it away. So it's, it's a great opportunity uh, to get scholarships. And you mentioned Structures Congress, and I think that's your second point in the article. Could you go into what the benefits of students going to the Structures Congress is or for, or for what you meant by that point? Yeah, definitely. I, I've been to the to Structures Conference, I think, twice already. And I think it's an amazing experience, especially for students, because first, obviously, you get whatever what everybody gets, right? Great presentations and uh, get like networking opportunities that just by the fact of going to a structured con Congress, you're gonna get. Uh, but specifically for the students, I think they, they also have uh, a lot of activities that uh, kind of uh, help you get, get in, start to, to get involved in this, in the community. So just the event, I don't know if you're familiar with Meet the Leaders event, that it's a kind of a breakfast, that it's, I think it's a great event. I, I have attended uh, both times that I, I've been and you, in, that, in that event, you get to sit with a really well-known uh, kind of leaders of the structural engineering field, and you're just a student, and you, you get to meet them, ask them questions, uh, just interact with them, and see what their, their, their thoughts are. And that it's a great opportunity that uh, people sometimes are not familiar with, that by attending the structural congress, you can, you can do this, part of, uh, 
or actually interact. They facilitate interaction with, with other professionals because you say like, okay, yeah, I'm going to the Congress, but maybe I'm not sure if I'm going to approach like, you know, somebody because I don't know, like I don't want to bother them. But ACI creates this kind of opportunity where they encourage interaction. So it's easier even for like introverts or to just talk and meet people and start that conversation. And once you start, you realize that it's not that hard. You know, we're all human, we all make mistakes. So, uh, and I think SCI that has a great, great part of that. Another part that they have specific for the students is the career fair. I think it's uh, mostly at the end of the, the Congress where you, they have several companies uh, that are looking to hire and then the students can go and just have their resume and talk to the recruits, uh, recruiters, sorry. Um, and obviously, that's an, a, a, an opportunity that you don't, never want to miss as an, a, as an student. You know, if you're looking for a job, uh, just go to the Structural Congress. Probably you can meet uh, people while in the Congress and then uh, then go to the career fair and, and, and take advantage of that. And another thing that it's a lot of fun, not specifically towards students, but it's the Structural Union Party that it's usually hosted by CSI, which I think it's a great way of meeting people and it's a lot of fun. And, it's, it's always, I don't know, these interactions that really uh, we need. Um, we need to grow our network and, and actually, uh, yeah, just uh, uh, find resources and everything. I think just is great. And SEI provides a great uh, kind of setup for this, uh, in my opinion. I, I couldn't agree anymore with you. I'm a huge, I'm like the cheerleader for Structures Congress. I absolutely love it. Um, this upcoming May or March will be my fourth Structures Congress. I, I love the event. Uh, and I think you made such a good point in that um, whether you're a, a new structural engineering student, whether you, you want to go into practice or stay in academia, whether you find yourself to be an, ex an extrovert who is ambitious and wants to meet people and network, or if you're an introvert and you're just there to learn, there's so many different things, so many benefits to going. Um, of course, number one is that there's the opportunity to learn from other engineers and uh, no one goes into engineering and expects that you leave school and knows know everything, right? Like we always, we're continuously learning. That's why we have PDHs and continuing education credits is because we should always be interested to know what's the newest research, um, what, what are the newest trends, what are the best design practices. And I think the other exciting thing is that if you do intend to stay in academia, um, getting your foot in the door by meeting with different researchers at Structures Congress actually gives you a better leg up if in the future you want to submit an abstract to present yourself, which is such a validating uh, accreditation to have to your name to say, yeah, I presented at Structures Congress my research. Um, and it can provide you more opportunities down the way if that's the case. I also, uh, I think that the amount of opportunities they make specifically for younger engineers are by far and the way better and stronger than any other conference I've been to. Um, and I also, if, if our listeners are, are tuning in and remember Anne Ellis from a few uh, episodes back, Anne is, Anne is like my dream career for an engineer. When I, and the, I met her at the younger, uh, younger members meet the leaders breakfast. And whether or not you want to be them or you just want to learn from them, um, I kind of think of this as like a little mini masterclass for those uh, younger engineers who are interested in meeting the experts. I mean, if anyone's watched a masterclass, you can listen to Bob Iger, who is the CEO of Disney, tell you all about the way he sets up his routine and his career. And you get a one-on-one -on -one personal interaction with the Bob Igers of structural engineering. And I had the opportunity to meet Anne there. And since, since, that, since that meeting, I mean, she's been a champion for me. She's brought me into different committees. She's gotten me um, different opportunities because she saw where my ambitions uh, line and and she had the w the ability and the connections to make it happen. So it is so critical that you don't just show up. You take part in all of those different opportunities to interact because they are they're really it's a catalyst to getting you to the next level or or getting you to the next opportunity that you you think you want to participate in. So I I couldn't agree more. Wonderful. Um, the last and third item that you wanted to share with everybody. Um, that benefit is the Graduate Student Chapters Leadership Council. Um, I have no idea what that is. Can you tell us what, what is that benefit and what, what's the benefit of being part of this kind of a council? What is it? Yeah, so actually this is for me extremely important point. Uh, actually, it's the, for me it's the most important point actually. Uh, because first of all, to get the, to get to be part of the Graduate Student Chapter Leadership Council, you first have to be part of that Graduate Student Chapter. So SEI now has, uh, we currently have 18 universities that have SEI graduate student chapters in the US. 
So University of Illinois is one of them. Uh, at Urbana-Champaign and actually at Chicago, they also have a, a chapter, um, Notre Dame and several other universities. And first, the opportunity of being in a graduate student chapter, it's, uh, it's obviously uh, dealing with uh, people and having the opportunity to have uh, leadership roles uh, within the, your chapter, your small chapter, you know, and, and actually impact the graduate student uh, community in your school. Um, we organize events uh, for students, such as social events and um, academic events, professional events, where we bring professionals to talk to the students and actually more geared towards a student interest. And yeah, you get the opportunity of organizing events, uh, meeting people, being in leadership roles, kind of lead an organization. Uh, and then this, the second part is that you get the opportunity to be in this uh, graduate student chapter leadership council. That this leadership council is kind of the the council that involves all the graduate student chapters in SEI. So they think universities can uh, um, send a, actually they have a representative within this council and this council has a board. The board uh, consists of four, four students from different universities. And what we're trying to do is kind of connect these all graduate student chapters together, such that uh, kind of uh, start interactions with uh, within the graduate student chapters and start collaborations kind of start to build a network of, grads, of SEI graduate student chapters, kind of a, as an overall organization. And obviously being part of that gives you the opportunity of meeting people from other universities that are actually interested in, in leadership roles and are actually students that are uh, looking forward for the opportunities. So it's, it's really good to meet that uh, kind of people, uh, that the people that get involved in this leadership council. And also gives you, I've been the chair of this council for uh, two years uh, now, and my term is gonna uh, end this uh, September, but this gave me the opportunity of uh, meeting a lot of people, being in charge of uh, this organization, obviously, the, and the opportunity to go to the SEI local leader conference, that it's a, a small conference that SEI organized for their leaders, graduate student chapters and professional chapters leaders, where they just give us leadership training and then you can meet all the other leaders from the professional level and from the student a graduate student chapter level which is also great because you you get to meet people with all different kinds of backgrounds people that have learned many things that you are trying to learn or, or you know that give you advice on where to move or where, where to look and it, i think it's just great uh, is is uh, being involved with the graduate student chapters and the leadership council um gives you a lot of different tools that you wouldn't get otherwise like communication skills you can imagine that me having as uh, i'm from mexico so my first language is spanish i always had a little bit of trouble speaking english so after i start to get more involved in the graduate student chapter interacting with other students although my english is not perfect it improved a lot <laughs> so and just things like that you know it's it's uh, interacting with other students and being able to to meet a lot of people it's kind of the, the main thing I think your, your English is nothing short of perfect. I think it's been really fantastic. And the ability to communicate really technical um, topics in an eloquent fashion as you have in a second language is incredibly difficult. Um, so I commend you and, and anyone, honestly, who, who is not a native English speaker who comes to the US to, to study a really scary topic like thunderstorm implications on structural engineering is, is that's, that's a level of bravery and courage that I think we all could admire. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, and it's great to see that it's, you know, even in academia, your, your network and building all these communication skills too, it's, it's really important. And it's glad to see that it's, you know, it's still applicable, whether you're trying to go into industry or academia. Uh, Antonio, I had one last question since, you know, you're going the PhD route. For people that are considering the PhD route, do you have any advice or maybe go through what it's like being a PhD student? Because that's something I've always wondered too. Um, like kind of what the PhD is like going that route, what's it like? Do you have any uh, advice for people or can you go more into that, what it's like being a PhD student? Definitely, actually that's something that I, as I mentioned before, I struggled with when I was making the decision to go for a PhD route. Uh, basically, I think there are two truly important things for deciding to go for a PhD. You have to really love what you're doing, enjoy your research a lot. Because if you don't love it, you are not gonna get through PhD. Like, <laughs> I mean, I think that's true for a lot of things in life, but 
you have to enjoy what you're doing, but in PhD, like, you're going to give up if, if you're not really enjoying what you're doing. And also, I think the relationship with your advisor is crucial, if, uh, in my opinion, because your advisor is the one that is guiding you towards, like, this shady topic that you're just really don't know much and you're starting to explore and your advisor is the one that gives you the guides and if you have a good relationship with him it's it's really good which i have and i think that's essential for a phd uh, then how to weigh down if doing a phd or a master's degree that's that's actually something that i don't know because I, i'm not sure if I, I i made the right decision but i i'm happy where i am uh, but um I do feel that the PhD work has given me more, a more analytical mindset and strategies to solve uh, some difficult problems that I'm sure you can also get in, 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 in industry. But I don't know, I, I just feel that um, I have had the opportunity to deal with challenging problems every day. Um, so yeah, I want to share a little personal story with you that it made me actually decide to get a PhD. And basically, they were three things that made me decide to pursue a PhD. The first one is what, that I... Uh, really enjoy what I was working on, on research, and I really enjoy working with Professor Lombardo, my advisor. And this is really important, as I mentioned before. The second is that I had the opportunity to do a PhD in a really top structural engineering university, such as the University of Illinois. And while doing the PhD has given me the opportunity of doing really advanced courses, for example, in seismic steel design or other topics that are not specifically related to my research, but I am interested on as a and that I think that can help me when I'm, I'm, I'm again, a practicing engineer. And three it was actually an advice from my dad. And it's, I don't know, uh, who is actually a structural engineer himself with a master's degree. And what he told me, it's just an analogy that it may work for you or not. But uh, if you look, he told me, if you look four years from now, uh, you will have no experience and a PhD, which is probably not as good as having a master's degree with four years of experience. But if you look, 14 years from now, you will have a PhD with 10 years of experience instead of a master's degree with 14 years of experience. Uh, the difference on, on experience will not be that great, but you learn, what well, you will learn with your PhD can uh, give you a, a lot of tools that you can use uh, towards that experience and also the prestige and, the, and the, the, the PhD is basically forever. So if you have the opportunity to do it now, he just encouraged me to do it uh, because basically he told me in the long run he's going to pay off. And that was, again, his view. I don't know if it will help you. Uh, and this is my experience. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and yeah, that's what made me excited to go to for the PhD. I think that's a beautiful piece of wisdom. And I think, I think we should all be told stuff like uh, an anecdote like that all the time, because especially when you're younger, um, when, I don't know, some, something about the beginning of the cusp of your 20s, you think, if you don't start now, you're gonna miss something. I don't know if it's a FOMO culture kind of thing. And if I invest my time to do something else, like take a gap year and go travel and, and see things that you wanna do before you settle down and start in practice, or getting something like a master's or PhD, what's gonna be the difference? Am I gonna be two, two years for a master? Am I gonna be two years behind my, my colleagues? Um, and when you put it in perspective, of, well, in 20 years, you will have had the additional, the additional accolade or the additional um, academic experience and the experience of yours, it's, it almost doesn't matter because the magnitude is so similar. Um, I think that's a really great mindset to think about these, these different ways we want to invest our time is in 10 years, in 15 years, what's going to be the difference and is the difference enough for you to want to go do this or not? So that's, that's really helpful. I think, exactly. I think it was a good reminder for me, if nothing else, I, I could use that, that perspective more often. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, PhD I mean, is forever and, you know, whatever you're investing your time into, it's, it's going to last forever. Like, no one can take that away from you once you get it. Exactly. And, and that's not taking anything wrong because I have also really that only do the master's because they don't want to do a PhD. And that's also okay. Not taking, not kind of uh, taking nothing away from them. But uh, yeah, just the fact that if you're really enjoying what you're doing on research and you truly enjoy and truly want to get a PhD because you're enjoying what you're doing and want to learn more. I think taking that perspective of like a long-term perspective is, is helpful when you're feeling like, oh yeah, everybody's getting ahead of me. And I think, yeah, having that long-term term perspective was what helped me decide that, okay, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I want to do this and it's not going to be that bad, you know? And, and that's, uh, that's what helped me, the advice from my dad. And, and, yeah. 
Well, and I, I want to, I want to spend one more, one more little bit kind of diving into this because I feel like there's some conflicting information out there. So I, when I first graduated from college, I had an objective. I wanted, you know, I found this fantastic job at Hilti, but I wanted to be living in a German speaking country as soon as possible. And in my mind, if I hadn't gotten there, if I didn't get there by 25 or 26, I was clearly behind in my career path and I wasn't doing things right, or I would, I wasn't succeeding and in, in meeting those different objectives I wanted to. And when you read a book, I don't know if any, if any of our listeners have read this, but Defining Decade um, is a really fantastic read by Meg Jay about the fact that the, your 20s are really um, a really intense time of your life in which your brain is, I mean, your brain is still developing until you're 25, your, your prefrontal cortex is your decision-making capabilities. Um, and she talks about um, the, the differences in your 20s and your 30s and those who spend their 20s doing nothing but um, self-serving um, or, or I want to say activities that don't necessarily lead to, um, professional, professional and personal development, um, who then start those activities when they're in their thirties have lost a decade that often gets you, it's the catalyst to getting you to where you want to be when you're 30 and 40 and 50 and everything else. Um, and so I felt when I didn't reach my first goal at 25 of being, of living in Germany, I thought that I was behind and, you know, I'm not going to, it's not going to happen for me until I'm in my thirties at this point. I just think it's so interesting because if someone had told me at 23, it's okay to spend seven, eight, 10 years developing yourself and, and spending the time to do activities here um, that are going to make the experience so much better when you get there, I would have thought of it completely different. And I think the same is for your PhD. You know, you, you found this passion in, in wind engineering. And if you hadn't spent the additional four years to get your PhD, would you be enjoying your practice that much more in 10 years, in 15 years, without that information that you so wanted to go and learn more about? And so I, I think if there's, if there's anyone out there who is confused or is, is trying to figure out whether you should or should not do something, um, it's worth the patience and, and investment of time to make sure that you do achieve those things that you want to, um, but be patient with your schedule. So especially our young listeners, you don't have to set the world on fire by 25 or 30 and it's okay if it, you know, if, if some of those things really come to fruition later in life, something I wish I had told my, my younger self. And it sounds like you're lucky enough to have a dad who told you that when you needed it. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, now that I've gone on that rant, um, just to wrap it up, Antonio, how can our listeners benefit from your research and where is it that they connect with you? Um, yeah, so hopefully they will benefit from my research once it's uh, done and published actually in ASC7 um, as a actually load, uh, as a wind load to design for against thunderstorms. But as of now, we publish most, some of the outcome of our research on our, at our research website and at Twitter. So for our research website, you can just Google wind engineering at UIUC and it should be the first thing, thing that pops up. That's a research website. You can also find my contact information there, like my email at illinois.edu. I'm not going to try to spell it because if you go there and you see it, you're going to see why I'm not trying to do that. <laughs> and also in, the tw in Twitter, we publish a lot of uh, kind of short uh, you know, summaries of what we do. Sometimes when we find interesting stuff uh, in the field, or because we also do some damage surveys or interesting stuff in the research, we do publish in, in, in Twitter that the handle is at windlab. And wind lab in, in Twitter. So I think you can find it and you can connect uh, with me through LinkedIn or really send me an email. And I also do have a Twitter account that it's at Saldivar, my last name, 1991, because it's my uh, year of birth. So uh, that's what I post so, so a lot of uh, my things of the research and wind engineering and stuff related. So yeah, to LinkedIn, you can email me, feel free to mail me if you have any questions or uh, you want to share something or yeah. And, Thank you so awesome. much again for, for having me here. And I really enjoy talking to you guys. Yeah, thanks so much, Antonio. We really appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's always fascinating for me to kind of hear, you know, where all our code stuff comes from and how they even come up with, the, with all the, the things in the code. And, you know, for you talking about wind engineering, it's, uh, I really appreciated it. I never knew that about thunderstorms. And it's always fascinating to see that there's still so much out there in structural engineering. So thanks so much for that and for giving all the great advice that you, you gave to graduate students and people that are looking to become a PhD or go the PhD route. So thanks again. Thank you, thanks, thanks to you, Matt. And thanks, Alexis. Thank you so much for having me today.
We hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 30. Uh, as well, you can find links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during the episode. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors. Thank you.